The Ric Flair Show. My name is Ric Flair. Woo! Woo! To be the man, you got to beat the man. And I'm saying, woo, right here, I'm the man. The 16-time world champion. Woo! Back behind the mic and telling it like it is. Woo! If you're not carrying the big gold, you're second best no matter what you tell yourself. I'm the best. Y'all playing catch-up ball. To the Nature Boy. And now, your host of the Ric Flair Show, Ric Flair and Conrad Thompson. Woo! Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ric Flair, 16 times your world champion, the host of the Ric Flair Show, along with my legendary, and I do mean legendary, co host. Conrad, by God, Thompson, <laughs> the second wealthiest man in the state of Alabama, home owner of the Conradison Estate, a top of mountaintop in Huntsville, Alabama, largest home in the state of Alabama, <laughs> right there with the Biltmore Mansion in Asheville. Need I say more? Conrad, how are you, sir? I'm good, dude. How are you? Good, buddy. I heard you had a big party this weekend. Oh, man, we blew it out. We had a great time, and uh, I think we're going to have a good time on today's show. This is a guest we've wanted for a long time. Oh, no doubt about it. Um, you know, <laughs> I look back on my career, and sometimes I think about the guys I had the most fun with, and, you know, because you don't see them as much anymore. Um, you don't, you know, you don't think about having them on a show like this, but I saw him this weekend, and he made me laugh so damn hard. So many great memories, and obviously one of the great performers of all time in our business, Mr. Greg the Hammer Valentine. And when they say hammer, I'm not kidding. The man was stiff. I was in the air. He was on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the ground attack. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Let's go ahead and get into this week's Figure Four Top Stories, brought to you by the RickFlair.com online store. They've got brand new items, koozies, bottle openers, hats, money clips, T-shirts, and more. And everybody needs a Ric Flair for president hat. Be sure to check out RickFlair.com and click the online store at the top of the page. All right, Rick, let's get going. The top four stories brought to you by RickFlair.com. Uh, SummerSlam is this weekend. What matches are you looking forward to the most, man? Well, obviously, I'm looking. The one I'm looking forward to the most is uh, Charlotte and Sasha Banks. Um, but uh, the card is loaded. I'm really looking forward to Dolph um, Dean and Ambrose. Dean. I'm looking forward to Finn Balor and uh, Seth Rollins. I think that'll be great. And I think, I mean, the card is loaded. Obviously, Brock and Randy is going to be a phenomenal match. And of course, then you've got AJ and uh, um, John Cena. So um, it's loaded. It's a WrestleMania card. Uh, SummerSlam, I think, is considered their second largest and most successful event. And boy, they're loaded for bear. They're all there right now. And, uh, having fan access this week, I have a huge NXT show on Saturday night that is sold out. So, I mean, business is good, and WWE is in a good place. Absolutely, they are. And uh, let's go ahead and get into top story number two. Conor McGregor calls out John Cena. It just seems like this uh, is a story that won't go away. Conor first mentioned you this past week, Rick, and said, quote, Ric Flair's a legend, but as far as gimmicks, this is the real thing over here. I think these WWE guys, they're not right in the head, some of them. I mean, the new guys are dweebs. Let's be honest, absolute dweebs. But the old guys are legend. Ric Flair is a legend. Uh, the McMahons, of course, dons. But I just say it as it is, they're dweebs. Your response? Uh, you know, I'm just bowing out of this. <laughs> you can't win. I, I, you know, I, I don't agree with that thought process. But at the same time, um, you know, I watched Connor the other day in an interview on ESPN. Um, the guy is a very intellectual guy. He is smart. And I kind of look at it like we talked about before. Is uh, He's so smart that he uses the notoriety of the WWE as a platform um, to get more um, uh, attention, draw more attention to the fight with Diaz. I mean, it it works. Uh, we're the focus of media everywhere we go, so it's good. But I, you know, I'm watching him, his workout and all that. He, he he looks like he's pretty tough, you know. 
I don't want to put anybody else in a bad position. I, I keep volunteering everybody else but myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if the guys are appreciating that. <laughs> well, I know you uh, you are at least a casual watcher of UFC. Oh, who, do yeah. you think, who do you think takes that this weekend, Conor McGregor or uh, Nate Diaz? Yeah, now that I've watched it, I watched the rematch last night, actually, it was on TV. Um, or I watched the first match last right. night, and uh, I think it goes to McGregor. I think what he said that he didn't realize he hit the guy with everything in the house and but couldn't knock him down, so he's got a different strategy going in. Um, but he looks to be in great shape, and he definitely isn't afraid of anybody. I mean, he, he, <laughs> he's right there in everybody's face. But Diaz is tough, and he's given away—is he given away twenty or thirty pounds? Uh, Diaz is the bigger man, and um, yeah. he's but it's, uh, it's a considerable, at least twenty pounds. Away. Yeah, that's right. Connor's coming up. Uh, so yeah. it'll it'll be interesting to see how it works out. I'm a huge fan of both guys. I've been a yeah. Diaz brothers fan forever, and and who do you like? Uh, I, I actually would hope that Conor McGregor wins. I think that's what's best for business. Uh, but I'm very very happy that Diaz won the last one. It's a big win. He's needed for a long time as far as one that's going to get him paid. Uh, yeah. and, and it would be huge business if they did a rubber match to me. I feel like Connor lost a little bit of shine. Tickets are still available for that show. Normally, his fights sell out very quickly. Uh, if he comes back and wins in dramatic fashion, they will have a third match, the rubber match, and that mm-hmm. one would do huge business for everybody. So that's what I'd like to see happen. Well, what I would like to see happen, I'd like to see um, Dana White fly me in and have me hit the ring. <laughs> Take out like the brass knucks, knock out whichever one they want me to, put the other one on top of the other one, get the one, two, three, and head back to SummerSlam. I like it. I like it. Let's, <laughs> let's get to top story number three. All right, Rick, we haven't talked about this in a while, but some big news out of TNA this week. Dixie Carter has been replaced by Billy Corgan as president of Impact Wrestling. Uh, your thoughts on this decision and maybe what it means to TNA? I didn't even know that, and that's how out of the loop I am with TNA. Um well, you know, Dixie took, uh, she had tremendous pride in her product, and I think she worked hard and put a lot of her life into it. I'm sad that uh, she's out. I think I, there must have been a decision by her family. Um, but at the same time, they just they just haven't made money that I know of uh, in a long time. The guys are always uh, being paid uh, later than which uh, later than the money is due. Uh, I mean, I, went, I experienced that myself while I was there, but um, just always an excuse. But, I mean, uh, she treated me great, and I've got nothing bad to say about her. And uh, she has a nice family, and I'm sure that she'll make it in the long run. I'm sure she will, too. Uh, Billy Corgan, I believe, is an investor for TNA, so mm-hmm. that may have been part of I don't know who of, that is. Uh, he is the uh, lead singer of the band Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, that was a really big deal in the 90s, uh, multi-platinum artist. A uh, huge wrestling fan based out of Chicago. Oh, ran his own little don't promotion. say that at, the, at, the, at that that I didn't know who he was. I'll be getting killed on that. <laughs> well, in, in fairness, Rick. Billy, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fairness, uh, n- nobody sixty-seven knows who Billy Corgan is or the Smashing Pumpkins are. So you shouldn't you shouldn't be offended by that. And who are you saying is sixty-seven? Uh, I don't know. And with that note, let's go to top story number four. <laughs> Uh, so this is going to be a fun one for us, Rick. Disaster in what I'll call Dudleyville. Uh, an independent, easy for me to say, an independent promoter had delusions about a big event in Dudley, Georgia over the weekend. And even yeah. had some of your old running mates from the horsemen there. What in the world did you hear happened? Uh, he didn't pay him. And, uh. Uh, you know, I don't want to mention what one of my one of my friends <laughs> didn't take that too well. I think he took him hostage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, ultimately, they didn't get their money, so um, it was not a good experience. And uh, these people, um, these, hold on, just one second. These people, um, um, you know, these small time promoters. Um, you know, they do these things with expectations of, you know, having big things happen and, uh, they just don't happen for them. So, you know, it's, it's, it's risky. Um, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm represented by people that get my money before I, before I get on the plane, much less, you know, in a car to drive down there. So, um, it's unfortunate, but it happens. And it's, uh, it's not the first time it's happened to some guys that we, I know that it, and it won't be the last. It's just unfortunate that guys that have worked so hard and have such a high 
profile in our industry uh, from past years would be embarrassed by something like that. But that's what goes on with independent wrestling sometimes. So nothing like this has ever happened to you? No, no. I do. Ha- I did work for a guy that shorted me money, um, but uh, that was a long time ago, and uh, I've already discussed that with him. Um, I've had a couple people short me money, but we won't bring that up again. <laughs> sure. That's sensitive people out there. <laughs> but no, that hasn't happened in a long time. I've been very fortunate that I'm working for much more high-profile people. And we're very fortunate to have Greg the Hammer Valentine with us. We're going to have Greg on the other side of this break. Don't you go anywhere. Stay tuned. The Hammer. The Hammer. I'm going to bring everybody up to speed about me. In 1975, an airplane was 4,000 feet in the air. It went, whoom, it crashed into the ground. And they said Ric Flair would never wrestle again. Six months later, I was standing in the ring Wearing gold. If you want to be the man, you got to beat the man. Woo! Okay, so we're going to do something fun before we get to this week's interview. And uh, I just want to get in our way back machine. Two weeks ago, we gave away a copy of the Big Gold Belt. And the winner of that contest was Mr. Matt Babb. He has posted a lot of phenomenal pictures, posing with his new world title and his family. You don't want to miss that on Twitter. We have actually retweeted it from the show account. So you can check that out at Ric Flair Show. Uh, but this week, we're going to give away Rick's first NWA world title. Uh, and this is an exact copy of the one that he won uh, way back in the day with Dusty Rhodes, Terry Funk, uh, Jack Briscoe, Harley Race. All the greats held this one, and it's autographed in a big, bold blue Sharpie. Uh, to be the man, you've got to beat the man. And this was the only way to win it. You had to listen to this show. You had to f- find us on social media. Then you would go ahead and leave a review on iTunes. And if you screenshotted that, and posted hashtag Ric Flair. You were entered. It was really that easy. And now it's time to reveal this week's winner of our NWA World Title Giveaway, Joey Powell from North Carolina. Joey left his review under the handle jpowell112, and now he can celebrate with his NWA World Title belt. Congratulations, Joey. Now, if you didn't win the big gold belt or you didn't win the NWA World Title, don't you dare be sour. We're going to keep this fun going, and we're going to give away an autographed Ric Flair replica robe. Every Ric Flair fan wants their own Nature Boy robe, but that's easier said than done. But here's your chance. These things sell for hundreds of dollars online, but now this one can be yours for free. It's a beautiful pink robe. It's got the feathers. It is reminiscent of the good old days of the Nature Boy Ric Flair and his fabulous robes. And we're going to make winning this thing super easy. We're talking about shares on Facebook and retweets on Twitter. Uh, Anytime you see this pink robe over the next two weeks, if you share it or you retweet it, that's going to count as an entry for you. That's all you've got to do. Now, of course, the name of the game here, we're trying to introduce more folks to the Ric Flair Show. So be sure to tell your friends, share it on your wall, talk about it, encourage everyone to listen, and more importantly, to subscribe. New subscriptions really, really help the show and keep it free for you. But now we're even going to give you an incentive to tell your friends about the show. And it's the replica Nature Boy robe. It's pink. It's got feathers. Who doesn't want to strut around their house in that? It can be yours for free. Just be sure to share that on your Facebook wall or retweet it from our accounts. Now, you don't have forever to do this. We're only doing this for the next two weeks, and we're going to announce the winner of this beautiful robe on the August 31st edition of the Ric Flair Show. So you've got two weeks from today. If you're listening on the 17th, you have two weeks, but don't let this slip up on you. We will have a winner come Wednesday, August 31st. Look for those posts on Facebook and on Twitter. Be sure to share them. Be sure to retweet them. Good luck, everybody, and I hope you enjoy your brand new Ric Flair replica robe. Now back to more Ric Flair show. All right, Rick, let's talk about our favorite sponsor on the show. Of course, it's Mack Weldon, and this is a big deal, man. You're rocking some Mack Weldon right now, isn't that right? Of course I am. And here's the thing. Yep. Rick's wearing it. You know it's the styling and profiling thing to be wearing, and it's better than whatever you're wearing right now because Mack Weldon believes in smart design, premium fabrics, and simple shopping. Just a couple of clicks, it's in your basket, boom, it's at your house before you know it. And Mack Weldon has the most comfortable underwear, socks, shirts, undershirts, hoodies, even sweatpants that you'll ever wear. And check this out. If you're active, they have a line of silver underwear and shirts. 
that are naturally antimicrobial. What's that mean? It means you don't stink. It's going to eliminate the odor. They want you to be comfortable. They want you to look good and feel good no matter what you're doing. Working out, going to work, going on dates, just everyday life. But how's this for a guarantee? They want you to be so comfortable that if you don't like your first pair, you can keep it and they'll still refund you. No questions asked. What do you need to do? Get hooked up with some great gear right now at MacWeldon.com. And just because you listen to the Ric Flair Show, they're going to give you 20% off when you use the promo code. What's that promo code, Rick? It's F-L-A-I-R, Flair. MacWeldon.com. Hook it up. Promo code Flair, 20% off. Now back to more Ric Flair Show. Woo! How to be the man. And once again, I find myself wanting to assure every young man out there, every middle-aged man out there, any older gentleman out there, that their life is in their own hands. And if I were you, I would approach each day just like I do. You know that you are the man. You feel good about yourself. You have a positive, positive outlook. No matter how dreary things might be, no matter how upside down your life can be at different times, God knows mine has been a million times. But knowing that I am the man and will always be considered the man, I keep that positive attitude. I have to believe I'm the man going forward, and I am going to believe that. My name is Rick Flair, and I'm telling you, I'm the man. To the Ric Flair Show. I can't help it that I look good, smell good, can't dance all night long. I can't help that I'm the greatest wrestler alive today. The Ric Flair Show. And now, more Ric Flair. The Hammer. How you doing, kid? Good. I'm sitting out here on the patio on the beach. North Reddington Beach is beautiful this morning. Oh, awesome, awesome. Well... You know, it's funny that we see each other so rarely, but when we do, we always end up laughing. And so many great memories, many great stories. Um, you know, for a lot of the fans out there, that I, most of them I think know this, a lot of them might not. But I first um, uh, traveled and worked with Greg's father, Johnny Valentine. Um, and John was in the plane crash with me in 1975 that ultimately left him paralyzed from the waist down. So um, when that happened, um, George Scott put the call into Greg, and Greg, you can bring us bring us, <laughs> bring us up, to, up, to, up to par on a lot, or bring us up to speed and all that. But at the time, Greg, Greg was traveling around with Don Fargo. <laughs> You'll have to tell Yeah, that was, a good, that was a good education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell a couple of Don Fargo stories. <laughs> yeah, they were very, very craziness. I mean, uh, you were tame compared to him, but <laughs> you weren't that tame. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I mean, uh, the Don Fargo, nice. <laughs> you didn't have your, you didn't have your, uh, your dick pierced, and then you ran a chain up to. Your uh, ear that was pierced, and walk around a bunch of girls. <laughs> That's what Fargo did. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> and he said he'd see he'd see a woman at a party or something, and he'd say, "Let me see your earring." She'd take it off, and he'd whip the thing out and put it in his weenie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. No, I I've been I have been guilty of a lot of things, but that's not one of them. <laughs> Jesus! Or he used, no, to, he used to walk around. He used to walk around the dressing room naked, and he'd ask everybody where his tooth. If he seen his toothbrush, and he had this toothbrush stuck up his ass, first in the crack of his ass. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. And my dad goes. My dad was in the territory a couple times in Cleveland, Buffalo, and he goes. I don't know if I like you running around with him. 
<laughs> and your dad can be your dad can be pretty rough in the ribbon department too. Good lord! Yeah, um, he should talk, right? Yeah, exactly. God, thank God I was his friend. He never did anything to me, but oh my God, Johnny Valentine was a phenomenal, great worker, and they say he's probably one of the smartest guys didn't ever. Didn't he? Uh, didn't he? Uh, one time when you had to pee really bad, drive off and leave you somewhere? Yeah. He did, he did that a bunch of times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we were, we were eating somewhere. jalapenos from Church's Fried Chicken, and they came in this in this cart that had the the, the, the jalapeno juice in it, and he poured yeah. it in my lap. You know, you know how hot that was, right? I mean, oh my god. Yeah, yeah he was he was too much. The worst though was <laughs> the worst, but the funniest was uh, Nelson Royal, who was a you met, you met Nelson many times. Um, sure. a, a, a local star in the Mid Atlantic area, but a really good performer, good wrestler. And we were at the Raleigh TV, which Greg remembers well. And they had these metal racks above the above the wind above the lights and the mirrors in the dressing room. And Nelson Royal would take his cowboy hat and put it upside down on the rack. So, well, <laughs> while Nelson was downstairs, John. Uh, you know, did his business in, he put, he lined it with newspaper, thank God, but he did, right. he took a dump in Nelson's hat and put it back up. So they called Nelson for interviews and he went upstairs and he took his hat to put it on and there was, oh no, oh, oh yeah, a pile of crap. Man, he came flying downstairs. It was a pull apart to get to get him off your dad. He was trying to kill your dad. Oh, he was just he was just covered in crap. It was terrible. Oh, oh, it was brutal. I mean, that's just one of many. I mean, God, uh, God he was, we drive on the road. This is how rough the business was and how how bad it was. And he would do the same thing in a red man tobacco pouch, right? And he would carry yeah. it in the back of the car. And while he was giving red man, he'd be like fanning the, the, the odor from the from the tobacco pouch to the three people in the car. It was unbearable. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think, I don't think it was called red man. I think it was called elephant butts. Yeah, whatever it was. Some strange brand that yeah. he had. And he used to he used to mix uh, cow shit with it. And yeah. and he kept giving it to Buddy you know, Buddy Roberts loved him and they called him Dale Valentine for a while. Yeah. And he would mix he mixed the uh the the uh, cow cow turds with the tobacco. So Buddy he was chewing tobacco because he idolized my father, he wanted to be just like him. He was chewing that tobacco for about three months. Yeah. And his breath was just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about the Buddy Roberts that just got put in the Hall of Fame with the Freebirds. Oh, God. Yeah, Poor Buddy guy. He great. passed away, but that, that's what he did. I, I used to share a room, and Buddy would be sleeping, and my dad would take his cane because he had canes after, you know, Chris, after the plane crash, and he'd whack him right across the knees in the middle of the night. Uh, I'm sure. Tortured him. Yeah. No, Buddy was funny. Uh, but at the end of the day, Buddy Buddy could perform in the ring. And, oh, uh, yeah. He was great. He, yeah, he was great. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he was that group with uh, Michael, of course, being the star, and uh, Terry Gordy being one of the really good workers in our business that time, and Buddy, were they were a great team, so... I'm, yeah, I went Terry to Gordy this year. Great. I saw I saw Buddy's uh, son. He was really a nice guy, and uh, it was really a, really a cool occasion. Conrad was there. It was a really nice induction. That's that's good and very well deserved. And uh, I'm enjoying just being a fly on the wall for you guys. But Mr. Valentine, your history goes back to uh, with with Rick to the Mid Atlantic days, isn't that right? Yeah, actually, me and Rick we meet in the well, I guess we had a, we met in 75, and I didn't know that was the same Ric Flair I had to wrestling. And he had a bald head, and he was 300 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so he, when we first, when they first put us together, it was a whole different Rick, you know. 
skinny, not skinny, but not fat, and long hair, and he had his gimmick together, the nature boy, and, and we're riding along. We've been together for a while, and he goes, you don't remember the first I said, this real, I, I said something about it. It's really nice to meet you, Rick, and be on with you. He said, well, I met you a long time ago. You don't remember. So he told me the story. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was the fat boy. No, I tell you what, yeah. Greg, what Greg Ray did Stevens is, brought you down there to San Antonio or something. So. Exactly. Yes, that's right. Actually, it was for Joe Blanchard, right? Yeah, it was Joe Blanchard, and it wasn't, uh, you know, it was like 73, I think, 1973. Yeah, 73, I had just started. I was I was with Dusty and uh, Murdoch and Joe and Ray Stevens, yeah. I've got that picture uh, tied to Dusty's house in Austin. But, um, yeah, that's the trip. That's the first time we met. Um, but anyway, you know, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but I did, and I think it worked for us. I think Greg was happy with the time, but <laughs> I found a place called Franco's that Greg and I invested a lot of money in, in Richmond, Virginia for clothes, man. We lived our gimmick. It was the beginning. Yeah. It was the beginning of the gimmick. Yeah. And you still wear the suits and I, I don't anymore. I got a couple of them, but you know. I tried to go with that for a while. And <laughs> finally, I said, I can't wear these suits anymore when I went to New York by myself. But I would wear them to, you know, the garden and stuff like that. So, yeah, we, we had shirt ties. I mean, we looked. And my dad did that for years, too. He yeah, always. Sure. Yeah. He well, had, all the I mean, old time guys did, remember? They'd come to the yeah, you didn't do, wearing, you uh, didn't do it. In, yeah, you didn't do it in the Carolinas, but you were in a big city. Yeah. I just saw Rick last week. In Buffalo, and he had. Did you have a shirt and a, a tie too? And a, I didn't have a tie, no, but I, I always try to wear a, a sport coat. Yeah, yeah, it looks good. You know, it, it's a living the gimmick. You, you look like a champion. Uh, it's it's very good, and I'm doing more more of that. You know. Yeah, well, you know the fans, the, the fans. I think, and I feel like they want to see see you um, and remember you. Um, from you know when they when they watched you, no matter what decade it was, I mean, so I feel so I feel like it's important to do give them at least a little bit. Uh, they're paying that kind of money for your autograph and picture to give them a little bit of of what they uh, grew up on. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I, I, yeah, I try to dress nice all the time, but short sure, you know, sure of wearing more, sure of wearing one of your robes in there, that would really be hard. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> well, no, I, uh, the robe, you know, the robe deal, I saw Rick doing it. I had a plain old black robe, and then I kept upgrading mine. But that, that was, we were the only guys that, we were the, Rick actually was the first one, and I was number two. Yeah. To wear them flamboyant rhinestones that we got from Johnny Walker's wife, Olivia's past yep. time. God bless her. But I mean, it, these, these were fantastic robes. Yep. Well, and then or, or, you. Orndorff uh, jumped on after that. Remember, Paul jumped on. Yeah, a lot of guys got jackets and stuff, but yeah. they they weren't yeah. they weren't like what we had. No, no. Oh, no, especially no. you, especially you. And, and then I actually ended up buying one of your robes that you never bought. She sent it down to me. It was so damn heavy. I hardly ever wore it. You had all kinds of jewels stuck on that. Yeah, thing. she There's loaded them thing. down. People don't realize Conrad. <laughs> Conrad has several of those um, in, in his home, and uh, it's amazing to think that you carried those. We carried those around. You couldn't check them because all the uh, people stole them in baggage claim. You know what I mean? So no, I remember um, one time you 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 exploded. You exploded at the at the baggage because someone had. You ripped your whole robe apart. Remember that? Yeah. Yes. And it came down a carousel. Yeah. <laughs> God, that was awful. Yeah, I know. We should have got him insured. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, remember, I got all my jewelry stolen in Greensboro that time, right? So I, right. I, couldn't, I wasn't even eligible. That I had to, I had to get what's called an entertainer, an entertainer's rider on my on my insurance. It was like five thousand dollars a year, which was unheard of. To insure jewelry, because like like myself, Greg, and several of the guys that weren't a lot of jewelry back then too, that we invested a lot of money in. But yeah, we uh, had Rolexes and shit. Yeah. You know. 
Well, the, listen, the greatest story, what made me laugh the hardest, and I got to tell this, and that Greg can tell you a side of it, but Greg and I traveled together extensively, especially when we were tag team writers. I think I would say we traveled together every day for at least three years, maybe four. Um, and uh, so we, the, the gig was that, Raleigh TV was Wednesday morning. If you weren't there Tuesday night, you were in Columbia the night before. And sometimes we'd make a drive in, in, a, in the Raleigh that night to, to catch the end of the party. But <laughs> if we didn't, Greg and I were, we were never on time. So we lived just a couple blocks apart, but we left late for Raleigh one day. And <laughs> Greg's driving about 90 miles an hour up Highway 49 in his cop. It was two cops named Newton and Atwater. I'll never forget. Yeah, Newton and Atwater. He, he pulled Greg over and said, you're going to jail this time, Valentine. So and he, he took us back to jail. <laughs> he put Greg in jail. And Greg, Greg, Greg gave me these car keys. And he said, he said, he you didn't bail me out. I said, Shit, no, I'm going to TV. Let your wife bail you out. I'm not going to get fired. In my out. car. <laughs> yeah. I said, what the hell? He took off of my car when they made Raleigh TV. I'm in jail. <laughs> luckily, luckily, I had another car, so I called <laughs> Julia your, to come and pick me up. Got you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> I thought it was priceless. He got the TV. <laughs> it, was, it was this old jail, and I mean, they like put him in jail. You know, like these guys were. One night, Conrad, they wrote thirteen tickets. Remember that, Greg? Oh my gosh! Yep, that got yeah. to the wrestlers. Wow, and they got Wahoo, Paul Jones, Rufus, me, Greg, uh, Jardine. They got they got George Scott. I mean, everybody coming back from Raleigh one night. Yeah, because they all took that shitty little 49 highway, because that's yeah. all they had, because the freeway took you longer. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, I remember one time that I went up to Rick's room. Oh, no. What was it? Rick threw his mattress out of his room at the Hilton Hotel. Do you remember that, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> Bad. But he only threw the mattress, so. <laughs> that time. <laughs> but the guy, you know, you listen to that Joe Walsh, Joe Walsh song about tearing up hotels and stuff like that. Well, we did that, you know. Well, we just had fun. You know, it, it was. Yeah, we had. We had fun. And that, uh, you know, it wasn't anything. It was never any violence or anything, but we did have a lot of fun. We enjoyed I think we made the most through the notoriety and God back then, if you were a wrestler for Jim Crockett promotions, you were a huge personality in the Southeast. Would you not agree with that, Greg? Yeah. And they had this great, uh, club in this Hilton hotel in Raleigh and they had the Buckinghams and people like that. that had a name. Each, they, each the, music the Embers used to come over there. The Embers. The Embers. Club. The Embers. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it was fantastic, and all the people would come and hang out with us too. And uh, yeah, it was it was big time. I mean, Raleigh, North Carolina is not a big town, but there's universities all over the place, and yeah, so it is a big town in yeah. a way. And a lot of kids and stuff, and they they love they love the wrestling. And wrestling back in the Mid Atlantic days was the only pro sport besides car ra- car racing, and uh, well, that was it. There's car racing, there was religion, and then there was uh, basketball with Michael Jordan. That was it, and then there was us, you know. Yeah, that was it. I mean, we, I think I, I think at that point in time, it was as much us as it was uh, ACC basketball. I mean, we were we were huge. Um, the uh, the Embers, the Hilton <laughs> was the best gig in the world. Um, that's where one night, you know, I was there. Greg and I and everybody were drinking, right? And this guy walked up to me and says, this place is a lot of fun. I said, hell yeah, it's a lot of fun. He said, any women here that like to do anything? I said, pick one out. I'll make it happen for you, buddy. What, what do you got? Oh, you got okay, mine? okay. I know where you're going. Uh, yeah, it, 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 was, it was a private eye my wife hired <laughs> to follow me. <laughs> no, but next, do, you remember, do you remember the time you dressed up like a woman? Of course. And I you did. came down to the bar? 
Yeah. And you sat right next to me, and I, I didn't know who you were. I didn't know it was Rick. Yeah, I put my I hand said, in the side. I said, gee, this, this, girl's, this girl's good looking, but her nose is kind of big. <laughs> <laughs> no, we tried to fake out Ray Stevens, remember? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Ray Stevens tried to hustle you. Yeah, I was I was dancing with Greg out on the floor. And he didn't know it was me. And that's that's some serious marijuana, man. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I, that that poor Joyce. I got to I got to give Joyce a shout out. She was a manager at Hilton Hotel. God, they went through a lot of crap with us. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Ah, uh, the good old days. I gotta, I'll never forget that gotta, because uh, that <laughs> when I got served those papers, they served Mulligan, Wahoo, you, and all the others that that uh, sheriff served them all the same morning to be in court to testify. <laughs> if I and Mulligan called me and said, "Listen, I like you, but I'm gonna beat the shit out of you. I ain't going down to that courtroom and talking about my life in Raleigh, North Carolina, just because you bought the privatized some drinks and <laughs> tried to get them laid." I go, okay, my, Jack, don't worry. I'll fess up. I'll take the heat. Everybody, my phone blew up. George Scott, Greg, everybody called me because they, they all got served to go to court to testify about what went down in Raleigh unless I, unless I just admitted to it all. So, of course, I, took, I went to the gas chamber for a couple of days, but that's okay. <laughs> Ooh. I didn't, I didn't want Mulligan punching me out. <laughs> so, hey, Rick, do you remember this one? We, uh, For some reason, we were all going to Corpus Christi to wrestle. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had to go through Houston first, and Mulligan was on the flight. I was on the flight. You were on the flight. I don't, I don't remember who else it was, but all of a sudden, I'm, I'm half asleep, and I wake up, and the, and the captain goes, Serving drinks along with our stewardess is Nature Boy Ric Flair. And he was pushing the cart down and giving drinks out, and he had his robe on. Do you remember that, Rick? Of course I remember. That was Eastern Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had a sense of humor. <laughs> he, he went all the way, he went through the whole deal. And uh, I don't think Rick had anything on underneath the robe. No, of course they did. <laughs> Please. <laughs> hey, I'm taking flying lessons now where I can wear the robe because I'm going to be the captain of my own plane. <laughs> oh, wow. God. <laughs> Are you going to fly with me? <laughs> yeah, we, we did a lot of flights with Freddie where we'd hire a private plane, take us to these long shots. And, uh, you know, Rick talked about the plane crash and everything, but he's still... He still got in those little planes, but we trusted Freddie. Yeah, I remember one time we got we got him divorced. <laughs> yeah, he, he was divorced in six months. He actually became me and Greg's private pilot because uh, we yeah, one, he was he so a, private. Yeah, he had, he had a, a little four, plane, a little a single engine plane. Cessna. And remember, he couldn't he couldn't uh, get it started. One time we we're trying to go back home to Charlotte. He gets yeah. out there and Rick pushes the starter button. He gets out there and take and hand cranks the propeller to get it going, and then we get in the plane and fly home. Now tell me that ain't. <laughs> <laughs> That's like World War Two. He getting out there and, and yeah. tra- or World War One cranking your own. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, you think we we're ahead of our time, Conrad? <laughs> uh, yeah, it sounds like it. I'm uh, telling you, you got to bring Greg into the Conradison for a party, man. <laughs> hey, so you guys have mentioned him a couple of times. I want to know some uh, some more Ray Stevens stories. I know that's a guy that was a big influence on Rick. And, uh, Mr. Valentine, I know you're familiar with Ray and probably have some good stories. What can you share with us about Ray Stevens? Well, he was, he was tremendous. And uh, they tied me up with him. Rick was on the other side. And so we were the heels and put their tag team belts on us. And but Ray would just laugh and tell stories, and, and he was just a happy-go-lucky guy. So he always had this uh, pit bull named Willie Nelson, and he'd bring him on the trips with us. And he had this big Lincoln that had this big dashboard that stuck out. 
the one time I didn't ride with him, I rode by myself with the wife, and I, I brought out my Alaskan Malmue uh, bandit, and he's walking around in front of the Ray Stevens car, and the pit bull went nuts, and he chewed up Ray Stevens' dashboard. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. All I know is when Ray came out and looked at his dashboard, it had big hunks and stuff ripped. That pit was so strong, he just ripped that dashboard apart on that Lincoln Continental. Oh, my God. <laughs> I tell Ray, hey, guys, yeah. um, make no mistake. We've talked about Harley Race being crazy and, and fun and driving a car 100 miles an hour. Everything Ray had had to be the fastest. He had a, back in the seventies. He had a Polaris snowmobile that would go 120 miles an hour. Wow! Yeah, I mean, if he had to have the fastest car, the fastest boat, the most guns. <laughs> am, I, am I saying that right, Greg? I mean, he, yeah. Every every car everywhere he traveled, he carried about three guns on him. It was it was a di- different time. I mean, he didn't, obviously didn't wear them out in public and that, but. <laughs> Ray would say, I'm ready for any kind of action. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I, man. You know, I, you, I was you with went to the sixth grade. Well, really? Yeah, he started uh, wrestling God. in L.A. for, or, for La, 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 is it LaBelle? Yeah. When he was, right. he was 15 no, uh, years old. Roy Shire. No, Roy Shire was, was it? Oh, LaBelle was, was L.A. Michael Bell was L.A. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he was a great I, guy. I mean, I, I when I first saw Ray, I thought to myself, and to this day, I think he's the greatest performer I've ever seen. And and he he, he, he just owned the locker room. He was so charismatic. I mean, he just you know, he, one of these guys never worked out, smoked and drank like crazy. But man, when he got in the ring, he was just. Uh, I, I never knew anybody like him, Greg. I, I that's my personal opinion. Well. And his work was so good. He's the one that really taught me how to roll with a bump, where you take the bump instead of just hurting your back, you just roll with it, and, and you come right back up, and you're right back up standing. And when I you, saw. When did, I, when did you when did you start taking bumps? <laughs> <laughs> well, the occasional ones, the occasional ones, you know. But I, I cut them off when I went single. I cut them. Off. <laughs> I, I tried to do that one that Rick does all the time in the corner, almost broke my neck, so I ain't doing that one again. <laughs> but a sad thing with Ray was I was with him when he he uh, he dived out. He just dived out of the ring, and he tore his groin. Yeah. Oh, my God. It took, remember that? It took, yeah. uh, I think that finished his career. He couldn't, he, it was such a bad tear. Yeah. It was terrible. The only one I've seen that bad, and I, I don't, you, I think you were in the WWF uh, at that time, um, was when uh, uh, um, Ron Simmons tore his back in the nineties. Right when Ron was out yeah. for a year with, you know, you know how big and strong Ron is in those. Oh huge my God! Eye muscles. Yeah. yeah, he tore his groin, and Ron literally couldn't do anything. I think it was almost a year, and that's you know for a groin tear, that's how bad it was. I mean, they're they're very. I've never had one knock on wood. But I hear they're extremely painful. So I had I had one, uh, but it wasn't bad. You know, it healed up in about a couple of months. But that's why it was really I couldn't believe you know how bad Ray tore his. And uh, oh my God, you know. So you never had one, but you had a broken back, and you had a gallbladder operation. I remember yeah. that. And you came right back. He had a gallbladder operation. I thought, well, he will, he'll be gone for a week. The next day, he was in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> well, two days. <laughs> two they, days didn't you, they, didn't, they didn't give you a choice back then. People don't understand it. I mean, I remember when David was born, I was in Minneapolis. I flew home, and I said to uh, call George Scott, and I said, George, I just need to stay one day. He said, if you're not in Raleigh by 5 o'clock tomorrow, uh, you'll start. You'll you'll be starting in in, in Memphis for uh, um, Jerry Jarrett. <laughs> it was the truth. Yeah, that's the way they talked to us, right, Greg? Man, we yeah. you, you didn't admit we had double shots, man. They want to know why we had to have some fun. My God, we drove we drove three thousand miles a week, and we were talking about Raleigh. 
but we went from Raleigh to Norfolk, which which was equally as much fun. From Norfolk to Richmond, which was just as much fun, if not more fun, than either Raleigh or Norfolk. And then we would go home 300 miles, and we'd go to Greensboro that night. It was only 90 miles, and we'd tell our wives that we had to stay overnight for a meeting. <laughs> we wouldn't even go home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we had a meeting, all right. Rick was up there. Da- we had a bar up there on the top of the penthouse, and Rick was up there dancing on top of the bar. I remember that. Yeah, thank you. Oh, my God. You know, you know. Um, at one time, one time, me, it was Rick, myself, George Scott, the booker, and Jimmy Clark, the promoter, and we are going to go fly to Dallas and go duck hunting with Bob Geigel. And we end up, we go into Dallas and we go to the hotel and started drinking and all of a sudden we decided we're going to go to Vegas <laughs> and we got on an airplane. Admit they had late flights back then, at 1 a.m. or midnight to Las Vegas, and we took off first class tickets right to Vegas and we stayed there for three days. And Jimmy Crockett never slept for three days. He just walked around, <laughs> kept gambling. Remember that? Course. And I won't tell I won't day. tell all the stuff that went on there, but oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that that was just the seventies. That wasn't even the eighties yet. <laughs> yeah, that was the late seventies. Yeah, that was the late I mean, we started our deal in seventy six, you know, and we uh, and we were off and on partners until probably eighty four because in in eighty two I came back or eighty three I, I I get mixed up on the dates. And you asked me to be your partner. I was a heel, and you were the big baby face then. And so we we went against Ole and and uh, I believe it was uh, the Sheik, and Gene was managing. Yeah. And uh, and I I wouldn't tag Rick in, and Rick's bleeding all over the place, and I kept giving him a short end. I wouldn't tag him, and it was a setup. So I came in, and oh, and Gene pitched me this this uh, cane, and he says, break it over his nose. And I go, I'm looking at this thing. I said, God, I don't know how I'm going to break this over his nose. This sucker is like did. a baseball bat. But no, it never broke, Rick. Your nose no, my broke. nose broke, though. <laughs> Jesus But Christ. yeah, so I hit him. I hit him, and all this crimson's on his... I hit him over the forehead, and it would just slide down and hit the bridge of his nose. So I tried it again. And... <laughs> nice. And it didn't, it didn't do again. And then Gene Anderson kept yelling, break the cane. So I grabbed it again, and I came down. And this time it hit Rick right on while well, he started moving, of course. He yelled at me, you stop it, bitch, don't try to do that again. And he's trying to get away. And, and uh, the, you know, uh, you're being held down by the Sheik and Ole and, so I hit your nose and I slid right down and busted you in the mouth. I saw blood gushing out of your mouth. I go, oh my God, what have I done? And I yeah, just just another day at work, Conrad. <laughs> <laughs> little little different so, than what you're watching on TV today. So great. Yeah, so it was um, all realistic, and they came and had an ambulance and took you off to the hotel. I yeah, mean, uh, I know hospital. Well, you know what, what I tell a lot of people is my favorite story about Greg and I and our matches is we had this long running feud with Orndorff and Snooker. And Greg and I were the heels, right? That we were really hot at that time. And the rib was because at that time Snooker weighed about 270 and Orn- Orndorff's finish was the jump and pile driver, which was perfectly safe. But that Jimmy coming off the top rope with that splash was brutal. So I got the two headed coin, and Greg and I would flip the coin to see who was going to take the splash from Snooker. <laughs> oh yeah, that was horrible. That splash. Oh, a couple times, a couple times he missed you, and his head would hit your head. You know? I know. God, are you kidding? <laughs> well, he, when he started the business, he weighed two twenty, but he got really heavy in Charlotte before he went to New York. And that damn splash up a top rope would kill you. Me with my broken back, it, it didn't didn't hurt me. But that's I, to this day, even if I like when I had that ladder match with Edge, if I land flat on a, or something lands on me hard and I'm on a hard surface, I can still feel it. 
stuff. But that, I'll you, tell you, you, I tell you, that reminds me of a story that me and uh, me and you were uh, wrestling uh, Wahoo and Andre the Giant. Remember, they used to bring in so it's, yes. So, so he would, we would come in and Rick would take a slam, and I would take a slam, and we all take slams. Rick could take a slam more than I could, but my back would start hurting. So, so that one time he gave me the giant swing, and we're in Dorton Arena in Raleigh, and they don't have any padding around the ring. And somehow I slipped out of Andre's hands, and I went over the top rope. <laughs> Luckily, I landed flat on my back, but I was completely knocked out. All I remember is I'm waking up, and there's flair over the top of me, you know, like giving me air and slapping my face, trying to wake me up, and he's laughing his ass off. He says, are you still alive? And, I, and, he, and he grabs me, and he stands me up, but I can't walk. I can't move. You remember that, Rick? Of course I do. People don't understand. <laughs> but I can guarantee you, you were in the ring the next day. There was no days off. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 someone, Virgil came down and helped me <laughs> and walked me back to the yeah. dressing room. And, you know, I'm 27, 28 years old. I'm healed up the next day, but I'm still hurting, you know. Yeah. Oh, I know. If that would happen right now, you know, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> Why, well, hey, Greg, I think, and I think Conrad will probably ask this question if I don't. Um, so one of the greatest matches I think that people remember in your career and one of the greatest matches of that kind ever, uh, tell uh, Conrad and all our listeners about the uh, dog collar match. Yes. And Piper. That was a fantastic match, man. You talk about brutality. Do you remember? Yeah. Star and, uh, absolutely. And people, people talk to me all the time about it. And I know Vince plays it on 24 seven. It's all on, kind of DVDs to everybody. And so, you know, I, I watched the match every once in a while just to refresh my brain on how good it was. But it was so, it was so unbelievable, unbelievably good. And me and Roddy might, might, might have talked about it for three minutes. I didn't know what the hell we were doing out there. All I knew is that, you know, work the collar thing. and But it ended up just, uh, there's no way you can, you know, pull a punch with a heavy truck car chain like that. I mean, if you throw it in the air, gravity kicks in, and you, you're you're throwing potatoes back and forth. And uh, back then, Piper's ear was mutilated because I used to beat on him on, in the ear with the, the U.S. belt. And then the dog collar thing, uh, it just it turned out, you know, it was like, you know, it, it stood the test of time. It was a phenomenal match. I'm proud to be part of it. But, you know, I think that was the first hardcore match ever. I never did another one of those. But uh, <clears throat> you don't see hardcore guys even attempting to do that match because you can't duplicate it. You know, it, it was it was that good. Thank you, Rick. It was that good. Yeah. No, it, it was that good. And I was thinking to myself, I got to go on after this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> Christ, I'm looking at the curtain going, good luck with that one. Well, you won the world title that night, too, so. Yeah. You know, that, that was that was a that great was, match, and you, and you and Harley were always great, but I imagine it was a little hard to follow something like that, but uh, you did it. And well, we, plus, when you won the championship, they weren't crazy. Yeah, that's right, but you won the belt that night, right? Yes, yes. World championship. Time. Was that the first time? Second time. Second first time, time was 81 in Kansas City. The second time was Harley in that. Remember the theme was the flare for the gold or something like that? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. So we had well, it all together, and, and we had a tag team that was Steamboat and Youngblood against uh, whoever uh, was the Canoodle, tag team champion. Canoodle and Slaughter. Canoodle yeah. and uh, Slaughter. So it was just a great card from top to bottom. And all the matches back then were, were just superb. And I remember one time, me and Rick, Wilmington, North Carolina, did not have a building, but they had a uh, big football stadium, and we flew in in a helicopter. Remember that? Yeah, of course <laughs> I do. They almost, they almost killed us getting out of there. <laughs> <laughs> the we mark, come in with a helicopter the mark, and land right. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it was Rick's idea, and I'm scared to death of this helicopter. It was a, a whirly bird, one of those where it was just a round thing, and you could see your feet, and you could see the ground, you know. It wasn't enclosed <laughs> like other helicopters. Oh, God. How did you get this into it? Yeah. Who paid well, for that? I, I paid for it. No, I paid you, for it. Oh, my God. But what, it wasn't that much money back then, but it was the idea of 10,000 people in, a, in that stadium, and that's the town that um, your father and I crashed in Wilmington, right? So the, I already yeah. had the history of the town, but we were that hot. Greg and I were that hot, and, man, we were both covered in blood, and well, we ended up, you know, uh, winning the match, you know, illegally, of course. And the fans, a while back then, Greg and I were literally running it as fast as we could to get on the helicopter because we didn't, the security wasn't, wasn't getting what was going on. So Greg and I dove in the helicopter and literally, like you see in the movies, the marks were trying to jump up on the, on those things that, that you'd step on before you go into the actual helicopter. As we were taking off, it was hilarious. Uh, it was unreal. We, we used to have, we used to have a lot of heat. We all had uh, Cadillacs, <clears throat> and uh, Rick would say on the interviews, "We're going to become screaming down the road in our Cadillac." <laughs> I'm the diamond ring Cadillac man, and, and then Wahoo would get pissed off. He says, "Damn, Rick!" He says, "Now they know what we're driving." But you know what they would do? They would just throw rocks and bricks at our Cadillacs and bottles. and So me and Rick would draw a straw to see whose car we would take. <laughs> we knew it was going to get beat up. Yeah, you know? God. But just funny because it's so funny that they were talking about stuff, and I hope that everybody's enjoying this. But it, it was the business was just so different. And I don't think I've had a guest on. Uh, we've had a guest on, Conrad, that, that wrestled in the 70s with me until – today but the 70s was a wild time in life for everybody and we just had a lot we were in the right place at the right time had a lot of fun we made a lot of money for that time uh for that for that time in life um yeah i couldn't believe it and you and you know rick uh everybody talks about the 80s you know because wrestlemania won 80s but it was really us from 75 76 right up till 84 or something that that mid-atlantic area was hotter than than anything and we were drawing more money than they were in new york and then they started plucking guys out of uh you know because they, they worked you know george scott sent me up there and started plucking guys out you know because yeah. we wrestled we we weren't just we weren't both sitting in the ring where we we put fingers in the eyes and pulled hair and pulled tights and I mean, it was believable because it was pretty damn real and uh ninety percent real. Holy Christ, I mean we we uh we made everybody believe it and we believed it ourselves and that's why it was so successful that mid Atlantic territory. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah, it was it was a great time in life. Um you know, uh, it's funny, um the um uh Greg, you know, of course went up to WWF and enjoyed a lot of success there, but um um you know seeing each other over the years and catching up, I mean, if you look at it, I, I, what Greg, you're what, sixty five or sixty six? Uh, well, I didn't really want to bring that out, but <laughs> <laughs> Well Conrad's yeah. already throwing me under the bus my age, so I'm sixty seven. Are you are you younger than me, right? Yeah. No, I know you're a you're a half, you're six months older than me. I'm going to be uh, 67 next month, September the 20th. Well, we'll have to have a bar, we'll have to have and a your birthday's in your birthday's in February, right? February, Something? right? Yeah, I'll be the biggest yeah. 68. Whew. Jeez, I remember so we'll Angela be the Moss told me if I live to be 30, I'd be overstaying my welcome. I was 24. Yeah. <laughs> But you're in good health, Rick. I'm in yeah. good health, and it must have been all that good good living we did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is, Greg. I'm, I'm I looked at you the other day, and you don't look like you're hurting that bad. I see the guys. No. I mean, I mean, geez, you know, I, I everybody from Ted DiBiase to um, 
well, God name it, they've all got hip, a Bret Hart hip replacement, knee replacement. I mean, Hulk has got two hip replacements and knee replacement. Um, Teddy's got two knee replacements. Bret Hart's got two. Um, I'm trying to think of the guys of our era that are the same. No, well, actually, uh, Brett is considerably younger than you and I. But I mean, a lot of the guys got banged up really bad. It just, it, it's the business, uh, you know, look, look at Mick Foley. I'll use him as an example. Poor Mick can hardly walk. Oh my God. Yeah, he can hardly walk. So look walk. at the matches he had. Well, yeah. I, I'm so lucky, you know, the only thing I ever tore was a quad, and that was a parcel tear, and that, that's fixed up five years ago. My knees are fine, my back's fine, uh, knock on wood, you know, I can still wrestle. Yeah, uh, well, that's, we have to knock I just, on wood. Uh, I, you know, I, um, you know, I'm very blessed, I'm healthy, thank God, you know, because this is the best, these are the best years for me because I'm calmed down to where I can actually enjoy life and think about the past and, and, and enjoy myself without having all these all this testosterone backed up inside me, you know? So yeah, I have to well, go you know, it's funny you say that because <laughs> I, I'm actually experiencing the first time. It's very, very hard, and I, I've i told Conrad this privately, and I've said it to many people. It's so hard to unwind from this kind of a living and to be normal, you know? And I'm glad you found that piece. I finally have, but it took me 64 years to find it, and that was a Well, you know, but, okay, but Rick, um, you enjoy getting out and doing the autograph things, right? Oh yeah, I love that. Of course, that 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 keeps you. You know, I love doing that. I got another one this weekend and, and uh, in Chicago, and I like that that because that puts you out there. You meet oh, all sure. these people, and we got a lot of great fans, and it keeps you on the road. But you don't have to take bumps for it. But you know, it keeps you going. You gotta you gotta keep moving. You gotta keep getting out there and, and, oh, I, and I uh, totally agree with that, that way, but I'm saying I don't miss yeah. not going to the bars every night I mean if you no. think about it we went to a bar every night 365 days a year for 20 years am I, am I at least I did I'm pretty sure I can vouch for well, you yeah <laughs> because you know I would I would get up early in the morning catch a flight and then go and then probably take a nap in the afternoon or I'd go to the gym and then I'd, I'd go uh, wrestle and I go, I can't wait to get to the hotel and go to sleep, but it never happened. Of course. I, I, Jesus. I'd be down in the bar and then I end up in somebody's hotel room and, and, um, and partying with the guys. And then we'd go to bed at four and get up at seven and catch another flight. You know, <laughs> oh, nobody gets God. So I didn't sleep for 20 years, probably, you know. <laughs> 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 well, I said, when, when you weren't answering the phone, as we were calling this morning, I said, man, we may not be able to reach him till one or two. <laughs> no, no, no. I got up at eight o'clock this morning. I got, I got uh, your um, uh, fiance's text. I just didn't text it back. I was waiting and I went upstairs to get some coffee and I heard the phone ring and so I missed it. But I, I've been awake since eight. I get up at eight. I live. I live on the beach, and I go to bed at midnight. You guys were both with Wahoo a lot back in the day. Do you have any memories of uh, traveling or working with Yahoo that people might like to hear about? Oh, my God. You, you, we don't even know where to begin. I'll just tell you one of my – I was going to tell this story earlier. Greg, we would do promos, of course, and we'd all be in the same room. <laughs> we were wrestling Jack Mulligan in Wahoo, and, and I did my thing, and Greg goes, what, what, what's that big fat Indian gonna do? And that dumb cowboy. <laughs> Wahoo. But they would take it to heart. Huh? They would get mad. They would take it to heart. Oh, I know. We go, Greg, go. That big fat Indian can't be never an athlete like me. Oh, Jesus. And man, Wahoo would come across that room. It's gonna punch Greg every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mulligan ran after me one time with him big fist. He is, and I threw, I threw a table in front of him and ran out the door. And then George <laughs> had to come out in the parking lot and talk me to come back in. I said, I'm not gonna. Mulligan's gonna beat me up. There ain't no way I'm gonna fight somebody six foot nine and he had 
the biggest fist I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, listen, and Jack Mulligan was double tough. Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my uh, God. Uh, yeah, but, no, yeah, no, Wahoo, no. Uh, the matches, I remember the matches I had with Wahoo, and he would just beat the living shit out of me and, and my, <laughs> my uh, and Rick. And we, our chest would be bleeding, and then George Scott would come in and say, here, just pour rubbing alcohol on your chest. So we yeah, did that. Neosporin. But, but, and Neosporin, but the rubbing alcohol turned uh, our chest into nothing but massive scar tissue. And so every time we got hit, it would break open again. And I still got scar tissue to this day from Wahoo beating me up. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, well, not only did he beat you up with his hands, when he, I, I tell people this, Conrad, and people go, yeah, right. Well, Greg can, can validate it. What, when these Indian strap matches, which I had a ton of, with, as did Greg, he would throw you in the rope, and he would and throw you in the rope for you to come running off, and he would hit you in the face as hard as he could, not in the chest, in the face with that damn leather strap, <laughs> right, Greg? Yeah, oh, well, man. sometimes, so sometimes his chops would hit you in the face. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I I remember one time I uh, I got. I finally started sticking up for myself, and I I nailed him as hard as I could between the eyes, and he just he looked at me, and his knee, knees buckled a little bit, and he came up to my wife at Bennington's later on. He didn't look at me. He looked at my wife and goes, your husband's one hell of a man. But he, <laughs> he, he liked that I threw that potato right between his eyes. But yeah. So I learned how to, and, and I know Rick did too, we learned how to chop from him, so we started throwing chops back. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. yeah but Wahoo is a, Wahoo is a not only a but he was the best. Athlete, he had yeah. the uh, he had this hangnail on his thumb or one of those fingers that would tear your skin apart. Yeah, on that right hand of his. Oh my well, God! Well, his right hand was like a catcher's mitt anyway. Big, huge hands. And he used to beat, I'll tell you the guy he used to beat to death was Greg's dad, Johnny Valentine. He would beat Johnny. He would hit him 20 times, and John would do that. And John would just fall for boom. <laughs> he would fall down and roll his eyes behind his head there, you know, so just see the whites of his eyes. He'd hang his tongue out, like, and it was purple, and the people on the front row would think he was dying, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But he probably was almost tired, but he'd love to get beat on. Yeah. Well, he was a great guy, um, and I just uh, learned a lot from him. I remember I've told this story, and people have heard me say it, but he, he he refused to let anybody throw him from rope to rope. He'd, say, he'd look at me and say, how can someone throw you or throw you across the ring? I mean, if, if, in real life. Right. How can someone throw you the ropes? But he was the only guy that got away with it. He wouldn't take. He wouldn't run across the ring to a turnbuckle. He wouldn't do anything. <laughs> so, he'd be hard at me when I was just a kid learning. Wahoo! He'd throw me around, beating me up, bouncing me around, boom. And John would go, "Nobody believes that." <laughs> I said, "Well, Wahoo does." <laughs> and I'm not telling him no, <laughs> Jesus. But John, well, there, it's, it's, guys, on the truth, he yeah. would not let you whip him from rope to rope. I that did. You know, I was. Tr- I was trying to do that. You know, I didn't want to hit the ropes. So what I did is I, uh, I just cut it in half. So a guy would throw, grab an arm, uh, grab a headlock on me. I'd throw him off, and I would take, let him take the rope, or I would do the rope and come off and hit him instead of doing the crisscross because that yeah, was exactly. that yeah. was pretty unlogical. But uh, just throwing off the rope that that one time is no big deal. And, yeah. and and we were in a different era, and my dad was the only guy that could get away with uh, grabbing some guy in the arm and hang on to it for 20 minutes. You know? I know, I know. They, were, they would tell us that we're lazy, get up there, you got to move, you got to move. But we, we we found a happy medium, of course, yeah. and, um, and we were very successful doing it. Well, listen, ma'am, we have kept you for a long time. I cannot thank you enough. How long have we been going? At least 40? 
No, yes, sir. We're, 40 minutes. We're, we're nearly an hour, and I know Rick wants to wrap not, it up, but I, I do want to ask an you hour, one more question. An hour Broadway. All right, uh, almost an hour Broadway. Let's get us there with a question about the uh, Andersons. Rick and, and Greg, I think a lot of folks who are younger fans really just think of the Andersons as Arn Anderson. But back in the Mid-Atlantic days, man, uh, Gene and Ole were tearing it up. Can you guys share some of your favorite memories about the Anderson brothers back then? Well, they were a phenomenal team, make no doubt about it. They had a, a fairly unusual style, too. I mean, they did bump around, but they were a wrestling team, and they they would, they would were the kind of guys that would grab a hold, and they'd stay in, and preferably an arm, and they'd stay on the guy's arm in a tag match, and, and very similar to what uh, Greg's dad would do. Uh, but, of course, they, they bounced around for the guys that made the comeback, but they were probably as traditionally a good wrestling team as there was. I think Greg and I yeah. had, had equal as much, equally as much ability in wrestling, but we brought a lot more flash and glamour to it than, uh, than the, and Anderson's were just playing, you know, always, I can remember always interview now. Hey, if you're a truck driver or whatever you got going on, and you don't think this is real. Come on downtown. <laughs> if you give me a trick. Well, yeah. 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 Well, Rick, uh, when we when they first tagged us together, uh, they were the world tag team champions, and we finally beat them for the belts. But they they would uh, me and Rick would wrestle them like fifty uh, fifty minutes every night. I mean, it was a long drawn out, and they just beat the hell out of me and Rick. And but they gave us an education. They really they really we really learned from that experience how to you know how. We were already tough, but we really became tough after that because working with those two guys. And, yeah, and, and they, Greg said, they, he said 50, not 15, 50 minutes. No, not fit, no, we were almost an hour every night. Yeah. And then I think when we did get the world belts, we did a couple hours with them. And oh, sure uh, then they got the belts back. And then I think Rick and myself were world tag team champions three different times. I know that for a fact. And, uh, it was mainly against Ole and Gene, Steamboat and Youngblood, and probably Stars and Carnival, and, and then you mentioned Orange Dawson and, and um, Jimmy. Who was the other guy? Jimmy, Jimmy Stuka. Yeah. And yeah, God. So we we wrestled, we wrestled everybody: Mulligan and Wahoo and tag matches, Andre the Giant and Wahoo and tag team matches, and and the World Belts. Tag team belts was not a semifinal. It was the main event when wow. me and Rick were together. So, yeah, it was. Well, we we were in a good position and we learned a lot. And well, it you know guys like Wow don't exist anymore. I mean, it, he was just and he he legitimately. I mean, he wanted to make money, but he legitimately wanted us to get better and learn our craft. And he was. I thought Wow, who was a tremendous teacher as well. He did a lot. Yeah, God bless Wahoo and and and, and uh, God, all those guys back then. It was it was just great. Yep, it was a great time of life. You got any more questions there, C man? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd like to get one more plug in there for uh, Paul Jones and Jay Youngblood. I think they were kind of uh, unsung heroes of the Mid Atlantic era that maybe younger fans aren't familiar with. I don't know. You guys had some feuds with them when you were tag teaming with and against each other. Uh, can you guys tell us any stories about uh, Paul Jones or Jay Youngblood? Well, I actually, I only wrestled Paul a lot in single matches. I did wrestle Paul with Steamboat when Paul was tanked, uh, against with teamed up with Rashke. Right. Do you remember that? Uh, and we did really well with that when it, you know, when I turned and went with Steamboat against Jones and Rashke. We did great with him, but... Um, I know that Greg and I loved working with Steamboat and Youngblood. God, they were a hell of a team. Yeah, and that's who I remember more. Right up our alley. Yeah. But I remember Paul Jones. I did a lot of singles with Paul Jones, too, because I had the U.S. and the Mid-Atlantic belt. I just saw Paul Jones a couple of weeks ago in Charlotte, and they gave him some kind of reward. But he all he could talk about was the matches he had with Johnny Valentine. Yeah. And how Johnny would just beat the shit out of him. Yeah, he did. And, yeah. and but Paul would Paul it would have had a pretty stiff punch himself. And and you know, they worked I think Paul Jones probably worked with Johnny Valentine more than he worked with me and Rick and Tag or anything like that. Rick is right. There's mainly young blood and 
Steamboat and the Andersons and Snooker and Orndorff and uh, I'm leaving out somebody else that Piper and maybe you know no not Piper but um, yeah uh, we, well we 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 wrestled Piper in tag matches as well um, and uh, yeah probably we, we just true. talked about you know we lost to Hot Rod last year but Roddy was a big part of both mine and Greg's life so once again Roddy will never be forgotten. Yeah, and I, I I know you made the funeral, and I, I didn't make it. I can't remember why I didn't make it, but good God, you know, I was there in spirit. And I had just seen Roddy in Detroit a month before that, and then two weeks before that, that he passed away, uh, I did his podcast. And, uh, you know, and then, then I went to Charlotte, the defense us there, and they told me, Piper just passed away, and I went upstairs and threw up all the rest of the day. So it was just like, it yeah. was terrible. It was hard for yeah. all of us, man. He was a great guy, but there, but in part of, but part of a, a big part of the '70s. And and, and 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 Dusty passed away too, you know, yeah. right after that. So. Yep. No, Dusty Good passed away a month before. A month before. Oh, did, is that all that happened? Okay, because yeah. that, that, that was he, that was. You knew Jack Mulligan passed away, what, three months ago? That was devastating. Yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, I heard that, too. That was devastating. Yeah. And, um, well, he'd been sick for so long. Uh, he, he and he's in a But I know place, that. Though. I saw him uh, in Orlando for that WrestleMania where he, were, all your ex-partners came out. And yeah. saw you on Monday Night Raw. Yeah. And I came out and sat there. So he was in the audience. And uh, he saw me, and he started crying. And uh, God bless him, you know. He started crying because he was just thinking about all the memories, and he used to live two yeah. doors down from you, and he, he brought up all that. And uh, oh my God, you know, a lot of good, a lot of good memories are always special be time and special people. Thank you so much for the opportunity to catch up and listen in and be on the fly on the wall today, Mr. Valentine. We appreciate you taking time out of your morning and uh, talking to us a little bit here on the show today. Greg, stay yeah. in touch, man. Yeah, we'll see you down the road, Rick, and thank you guys so much for having thank me on. I thank really you. enjoyed it. You, okay. you were a great guest. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, sir. You bet. All right. You, bye-bye. Well, Greg, the Hammer Valentine, man, uh, one of the old Mid Atlantic guys that we, yeah. uh, you know, we haven't had a lot of the old timers on. I know on the other show we had um, Ricky Steamboat on, but to get in our way back machine and talk about the '70s, it was a good time catching up with Mr. Valentine yeah, but, today. Uh, it, it, uh, he's got a great memory too, so um, you know, I'd forgotten some of the stuff, but we certainly have. <laughs> I forgot about that Dallas trip uh, and then going to Vegas and all that. We, you know, we just. We didn't even tell our wives. We just left. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's awesome to hear about the way the business used to be with, uh, you know, the different territories and no cell phones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was a different time, and and we got to be transported back to that today. And I appreciate you lining him up. He was a big time guest for us. So great. Well, thank you, C man. Well, on the other side, love, love don't you, buddy. You, don't you go anywhere. We've got a great segment coming up. It's Ask Nate. It's voicemail of the week. But first, This Week in History. We'll be right back. Planning a summer road trip? Grab thousands of hours of wrestling talk before you hit the road at MLWRadio.com. Binge on wrestling podcasts from the experts, those who have been in the business at its highest levels, and also those with insight and stories that you can only get at the MLW Radio Network. Out now, X. WWE head writer Alex Greenfield hosts a Writer's Room MLW VIP podcast with WWE Attitude Era writers Vince Russo and Ed Ferreira. Plus, the Disco Inferno crashes the show tomorrow. Journey back to the origins of pro wrestling Japan as Kurt Bauer and wrestling historian Matt Farmer spotlight the father of Japanese wrestling, Ricky Dozan, on the MLW VIP podcast, History in the Making. Then on Friday, MSL and Sullivan talk the latest wrestling news and then go back in time to WCW and tell you what really happened behind the scenes during the Monday Night War. Plus, much, much more. The world of MLW Radio never stops. Go to MLWRadio.com and binge on pro wrestling talk from the experts now. Woo! Woo! You're listening to The Ric Flair Show. I can't help it that I look good, smell good, can't dance all night long. 
I can't help that I'm the greatest wrestler alive today. The Ric Flair Show. And now, more Ric Flair. It's time for this week in history on the Ric Flair Show. Woo! Brought to you by MidAtlanticGateway.com. Dick Bourne and David Chappell are celebrating the memories of Jim Crockett promotions every day at MidAtlanticGateway.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special edition of A Flair for the Gold with your host, Nature Boy, Rick Flair. Also featuring BB the Maid. Tonight's special guests are Sting, the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, and their mystery guest. And now, Nature Boy, Rick Flair! All right, Rick, it's August 18th, 1993. It's the Clash of the Champions in Daytona Beach, and uh, you've been back in WCW for a short while, and I believe your old WWF contract wouldn't let you wrestle on TV, so WCW came up with a workaround called Flair for the Gold as a TV segment to get you on the air, and so at this point in time, we're building towards the war games at Fall Brawl with Davey Boy Smith, Sting, and Dustin Rhodes, and of course, a mystery partner against the Harlem Heat, Vader, and Sid. And you guys had just signed Fred Ottman fresh off his run with the WWF as both yep. Tugboat and Typhoon. What the hell happened? Well, you know, it's it's, a ter- it's terrible what happened because it's one of those things that's on live TV and you can't take it back. Um, I think Fred just tripped coming through the door. I mean, Fifi was there with Aaron and I. It was, it was hilarious, but it certainly did, didn't kick off uh, his career in the right direction. Well, you and, know, and he's a great guy. Who's uh, yeah, and so I, I don't know that you know this part, but Dusty has before has since told the story uh, that they kind of walked through this earlier in the day, and it was well, fine. They did. Uh, but then a prop guy rebuilt it with a two by four near the bottom that wasn't there the first time. So the the concept is he busts through the wall like the old Kool Aid Man in the old TV commercials. Yeah, uh, and in the walkthrough, it was perfect. But then the prop guys rebuilt it and didn't know the skit, so they put a two by four to stabilize it so he just tripped right over it and fred didn't yeah. know and, and tripped whose idea was the shock master I, I realized that the execution was off because of the it, fall it, it, it idea. so uh, were you in the meeting when he said let's go get a star wars helmet and let's spray paint it with glitter no <laughs> no if i was I, I think i was probably just chasing Fifi around back then okay well that that's probably explains <laughs> a lot actually <laughs> Um, uh, Arn and I were enjoying it. The, the show was too good, actually, with me and Arn. You know, Johnny Carson and uh, 
Ed, uh, Ed McMahon. Uh, Ed McMahon. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> if I'd been able to smoke on the show and I have a beer, it would have been even better. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any other memories about the Shockmaster? I know Oli did the voice. I know you guys had to be trying to hide your laughter. Um, any other memories about that moment in time or the Shockmaster in general? No, just that uh, Fred's a hell of a guy. You know, he was Dusty's brother-in-law. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And um, I see Bobby and now um, saw him all at the funeral. Um, but, uh, yeah, just go back. It was, was a bad deal for him. He, You know, it's <clears throat> your first impression sometimes. <laughs> it's the only opportunity you have to really, you know, steal it, and it just didn't work out at all for him. Well, it's going to work out for you, the listener, because on the other side, we've got hashtag Ask N N M L S number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson with First Family Mortgage. Woo! Check it out, Lincoln. Woo! And I'm the nature of Ric Flair with First Family Mortgage as well. But you got to get excited. I've been saving people all those dollars. They can limousine ride and jet fly now with that extra cash. And they can style and profile with a quick 10-minute phone call right now to 425-0105. That's 425-0105. Woo! Or 1FMC.com. Woo, 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 woo. Goodness gracious, quick balls of fire. Woo! The Ric Flair Show. Don't miss a minute of The Ric Flair Show. Subscribe on iTunes now. Nature Boy Ric Flair, the heavyweight champion of the world. Custom-made clothes. And any woman in the world I want. Just like that. And now, more Ric Flair. Ask Nate, brought to you by MacWeldon.com. Look great and feel great with gear that's better than what you're wearing right now. And get 20% off using promo code FLAIR at MacWeldon.com. If you'd like to ask Rick a question, just tweet using hashtag Ask Nate, And we can ask your question next week on the show. All right, Rick, this week's question comes to us from Gunnar Dwayne on Twitter as at P-E-N-N-S-T. 8DRR. That's uh, one hell of a handle there. He asks, hashtag Ask Nate, when does it go from partying to naching? It's a pretty good question. Uh, partying to naching. <clears throat> well, naching, <clears throat> I think, uh, temp revolves around a, do- a dollar sign. So let's say if a party is 1500 bucks, naching would be 5000 and above. <laughs> If Shawn Michaels, well, he, he told us the story when he natched and his father um, called him and asked him what in the hell had he done in New York for $10,000. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's it's legendary. Um, it's not always uh, the best idea for anybody, but a guy with your credit card could nature every day. I'm pretty <laughs> sure you do. <laughs> Well, so there you go, kids. There's the answer. Uh, it goes from partying to naching when it gets uh, a little testy with the credit card limit. Exactly, exactly. Uh, on the other side, the voicemail of the week. Hit me. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It's 2016, and the Nature Boy Rick Flair is still on tour, and he's coming to a town near you. And I'm talking to you, Colorado Springs. He's going to see you August 26th, August 27th, and August 28th at the Colorado Springs Comic Con. You don't want to miss him. He's going to be at the Mortgage Solutions Financial Center. And then on September 3rd, he's going to be at the official USC Alabama VIP Ultimate Tailgate. It's at Fishbone Grill and Sports Bar in Arlington, Texas, right across the street from the Cowboys Stadium. And then on September 10th, don't miss him in Rahway, New Jersey. He's going to be at the Rahway Rec Center for Wrestle Pro. That's Saturday, September 10th. At 6 o'clock. And we've got some great news for our listeners across the pond. Ric Flair is coming to the Wales Comic Con on November 5th and November 6th. The nature isn't across the pond every week, so when he's there, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss any of his live events. It's your chance to meet the Nature Boy Ric Flair live and in person. You can check him out right now on what his schedule is going to be at rickflairshow.com. Just click the Appearances tab at the top of the website. That's rickflairshow.com. Now back to more Ric Flair Show. Voicemail of the Week brought to you by Casper. Casper.com forward slash flare. 
Try the most awarded mattress in the industry for 100 nights risk-free with free shipping and returns at casper.com forward slash flare and get $50 off using promo code flare. If you'd like to be next week's voicemail of the week, just call the Ric Flair Show hotline 844-RIC-SHOW. Leave your name, city you're from, and your hot take. If you've got what it takes to style and profile on the show, call now. Toll free 844-RIC-SHOW. Now, here's this week's voicemail of the week. I got mail. Yay! Yay! I got mail. I got mail. I got mail. Hey, Rick. This is Clint from Gunnersville, Alabama, and I have always heard a saying of yours that I wanted to ask you about. I've always heard it specified that no hair, no flair. What's that all about? All right, Rick. So uh, Clint is on the money. We have heard this for a long time, uh, and I guess you've earned it at this point. What's up with no hair, no flair? Oh, geez. You know, <laughs> this show is is G-rated. <laughs> Since okay? when? And it just, just something I threw out there one time. So you don't like bald guys? Is that the deal? Like you hate yeah, so called Steve it, Austin? Exactly. exactly. I, I just felt like because I was fortunate enough to have a full head of hair, which I don't anymore, that I would just use the, the slogan, that no hair, no flair. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Keep in mind that was a slogan in the 80s. <laughs> uh, I have it on good authority that no hair, no flair is still the gimmick in 2016. <laughs> uh, it's just a preference. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we'd prefer to uh, go ahead and give some plugs to our friends on Twitter. Let's do it. You can follow the show at Ric Flair Show. Uh, of course, we are hosted by MLW. Check them out at MLW. Uh, follow the Mid-Atlantic Gateway at MA Gateway. And right now, they've got a fabulous series on Ric Flair and Greg Valentine's feud in the Mid-Atlantic Territory. You don't want to miss that over at MidAtlanticGateway.com. Uh, the man who makes us sound good, Mr. Jerome Fisher. He is at Jerome Fisher VO. If you'd like a great sounding voice to mispronounce your ads. One rib. One rib. One rib. Hit him up on Twitter uh, at Jerome Fisher VO. And of course, at 1FMC. Stop giving your money away. Start typing it in your browser, 1FMC.com. And uh, we can't get out of here without plugging Melinda at Legacy Talent LLC. That's the place to be. Am I right, Rick? I'm going to turn this one over to you today. I think Melinda knows how to make a deal. She knows how to make sure that you don't get stiffed in Dudleyville, Georgia. She knows how to make sure you get the money up front, and she knows how to look out for your best interest. Hit her up on Twitter, at Legacy Talent LLC. Rick, I had a great show today with you, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Planning a summer road trip? Grab thousands of hours of wrestling talk before you hit the road at MLWRadio.com. Binge on wrestling podcasts from the experts, those who have been in the business at its highest levels, and also those with insight and stories that you can only get at the MLW Radio Network. Out now, ex-WWE head writer Alex Greenfield hosts a writer's room MLW VIP podcast with WWE Attitude Era writers Vince Russo and Ed Ferreira. Plus, the Disco Inferno crashes the show tomorrow. Journey back to the origins of pro wrestling Japan as Kurt Bauer and wrestling historian Matt Farmer spotlight the father of Japanese wrestling, Ricky Dozan, on the MLW VIP podcast, History in the Making. Then on Friday, MSL and Sullivan talk the latest wrestling news and then go back in time to WCW and tell you what really happened behind the scenes during the Monday Night War. Plus, much, much more. The world of MLW Radio never stops. Go to MLWRadio.com and binge on pro wrestling talk from the experts now. This is the MLW Radio Network.